I like my gin with tonic, I like my vodka on the rocks, and I like my whiskey in a cocktail. Yep, we're talking about all the distilled pleasures in life this holiday season on Flying for Flavor. So I'm assuming you've heard about the new distillery? Yes, absolutely. Yes? Yes. So what have you heard rumor-wise about what they're making, and what are you most looking forward which, to? Which, which distillery are you talking about? Cross-Cut Distillery. No, I have not heard <gasps> You have about not. It. Did I've... you know that Cross-Cut Distillery is going to be opening on Kelly Lake Road in the next week or so? No kidding. Yes. Okay, so what are they going to focus in? Well, that's why I'm hoping that maybe somebody else would have rumors. So they're not. They're planning to do um, gin, uh, vodka, and they're planning to do a whiskey as well. But their whiskeys, of course, take a while in the in the barrels, right? I heard rumors of that a long time ago. Completely forgot about it, and here we are with it. So I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is Sudbury's getting its very first distillery, and that one's called Crosscut Distillery. You heard me kind of breaking the news. Uh, to my friend Deke, uh, another fellow chef. We were out for a coffee catching up the other day, and I've been trying to get the buzz starting. I was really hoping that by the time this episode aired, I can basically announce that they are open and ready for selling everything that they're making. But unfortunately, the bad news is that they are going to be delayed until probably the beginning now of 2018 for their grand opening. Uh, all has to do kind of with government stuff. Um, as any Canadian knows, regardless of what province you're in, there are a lot of regulations when it comes to producing and selling alcohol in this country. And every little box must get ticked. Everything needs to be double and triple checked because it is being consumed by the public. Uh, there's other regulatory bodies that are involved. But the good news is is, if you go back to the good news, that uh, everything is going to be done top notch. And it's partly because the owner and creator, uh, Shane, is coming from the government industry. He's actually got a background in uh, that field. He was one of the guys that was a scientist specializing in chemistry and toxicology for government positions in Ottawa. So it's just a perfect fit. So I'm going to give you a bit of a background only so that we have a bit of context when I describe all of this stuff. And this way, when I'm just having my general one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, that I had with Shane that day that I took the little tour, uh, you'll have some idea of where these conversations were coming from. So just a little background at first, of course, the place is called Crosscut Distillery. Uh, Crosscut, uh, he said he chose the name for three different reasons. Uh, Basically, he drew inspiration from Northern Ontario's industrial history, which is mining and lumbering. Uh, that term is actually used in both industries. Uh, in mining, it's a horizontal tunnel. And then in lumbering, it's actually one of those one or two man crosscut saws. And then naturally, crosscut also has to do with the distilling process. So you can look up the whole technical part of the distilling process online just about anywhere. Didn't want to get that part in today. I wanted to save the actual process of it and all of the details for when I go back in for my official tasting. So in the um, in the interim, um, just a little bit of background about Shane. As I mentioned, that he used to work for the federal government. Uh, he actually grew up in Elliott Lake, which is a another small mining community that was just outside of here, Sudbury. And he decided once him and his wife had their two young boys that they wanted to be closer to family. And with all of his background and everything, um, it just seemed to be a almost like destiny that uh, he would be coming back here and opening Sudbury's first distillery. Hey, we wanted a building that stood alone. Uh, it makes it better for fire reasons. Um, so that so that made for part of it. Our life right now exists largely in this end of town. I have young children who go to school not far from here, so that obviously weighs into it. Uh, but also, it's it's great. It's nice. It's an industrial park that's close to downtown. It's close to the schools. Um, right, when I say schools, university. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the right schools. The yeah. right, the right the, schools. The right yeah. schools. Uh, yeah, it's no, close to university. Schools. We're not terribly <laughs> far from Cambrian. 
And uh, yeah, I like the way that things are revolving around here. It's we did not pick this building because it was across the road from a brewery, but it certainly is nice. I'm uh, sure it is. Yeah, and we have a Verdicchio's down the road, my mother's place, a couple of restaurants just within walking distance once you move out towards Regent Street. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I really like it here. It's, uh, it's, it's been positive through and through. You know, the building was a machinist shop before. Yes. So it has taken a lot of elbow grease uh, to turn it from that to a food producing facility. It I was can imagine. about six weeks with the power off, um, me working away at a, with a power washer. Power off so I didn't, so I got to come home at night. Yes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was filthy. It had to be degreased and and, we're, and coats of paint on everything, and it's evolved really well from where it was. And uh, but from there, then we just started the building, and that's been a bit more of an endeavor than we were expecting. Well, I mean, it said you got to start somewhere, right? Right, right. So uh, you have beautiful, uh, beautiful barrels. Those are uh, they, they are. look they look nice and very new. They are they are <laughs> nice and new. They're all new oak. Uh, yeah. They're all out of Kentucky. Um, New oak is great for whiskey, especially for something that has a little bit more of a, a bourbon flavor. We'll do something along a rye. Uh, we use a grain mixture that would be suited for rye, but uh, with new barrels, it adds a little bit more uh, vanilla and oak, which would be nice. Smooth. Yeah, and so uh, eventually we'll have some used ones there for other products. Uh, some products don't. Uh, like new oak quite as well but uh, for now they're all nice and shiny they all have our logo on them on one side or the other and uh, it makes for a great uh, break in the room as well because we have to hide all of our bottles behind them. I didn't see anything behind them (laughs) (laughs) so it's obviously working (laughs) it's a working food production facility we have to have bottles we have to have we have to have ingredients. Equipment. Yeah, supplies. Yeah, that's it. It's uh, we can have a nice shiny retail area, and uh, and, we and we try. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and we just try and keep it that way. That's all. It's. Uh, yeah. So from what I'm seeing here, it's kind of looking like you're working not just necessarily just retail, but I'm assuming that you're going to be having an open to the public during certain hours, like a tasting bar type idea? Right. Yes. Uh, so there's a whole series of different licenses, as you can imagine, with mm-hmm. this industry. Uh, the first license will enable us to, well, produce and store, which we have. The, the next licenses will be will enable us to sell it, but also give samples and have a retail store. So samples at the beginning uh, until legislation gets caught up with uh, promises that were made yes. uh, in previous budgets uh, is limited to tasting uh, uh, the straight product and we can walk people through how to taste it, what they're likely to expect in the tasting and Further down the road, we'll actually be able to move to actually making cocktails with our products because it's one thing to show someone how to taste a vodka and what notes are good, but it's another if we make a vodka using an unusual ingredient and people sit there with their eyes out of their head going, this tastes really interesting, but how do I put it into a cocktail? What do I do with it? Yeah, and so we we can do make cocktail cards, but we can also... Uh, we, we can show people different cocktails because I don't necessarily like the same cocktails that you might like, or my, my favorites mm-hmm. are not going to be the same as the next person. So someone may like something savory, somebody may like something super sweet, and it just depends on the person. So yeah, we can show the products in uh, different cocktails. First thing, you just got to start selling it, right? That's it. The exactly. first thing is yeah, <laughs> sell it, yeah, produce it, sell it, uh, and get... Uh, more than one product out there. It's uh, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, the opening of the doors uh, is actually out of our hands now, which is a strange position to be in, but uh, maybe helps you sleep a little at, better at night knowing there's nothing we can do to speed up the process. We can just uh, produce and uh, get ready for when the doors are open. I think so. Yeah, and and once we produce enough, we get to play and make the more interesting seasonal products or the the one-offs, which is 
That's we we get need to the base level of the things that people expect. Uh, Bach will be the first one out, but then we can start making interesting things. Use stranger ingredients or uh, and the, the, what we would call uh, the limited releases, I guess. The, the stuff that we're not going to necessarily uh, push through the LCBO. The small batches. Right, right. Uh, the stuff where people are curious about what that botanical would taste like with vodka, or they don't even think that they would uh, ever use in one of their drinks. Uh, I'm not going to give things away, and partly because tri trials also <laughs> sometimes go poorly. Like, uh, <laughs> and if they go poorly, uh, they don't they don't see the light of day. Yeah, and, no uh, one ever hears of them ever. Yeah, and they're, they're a learning lesson. Uh, yeah, I think our first ones we won't have too much problem with, but uh, there's a lot of fun things that are actually grown in this area that would be interesting to play with. People, I think, underestimate uh, what's available in northern Ontario, and some of it has to be foraged, but some of it's actually grown here. It's, uh, so is that going to be part of your focus and your branding, is that this is not going to be just your standard hip distillery, it's going to have a very Northern Ontario feel using Northern Ontario grains, products, basically the backbone uh, of as it? As much as we can. There's going to be limitations. Uh, right now uh, we have about six tons of grain back there, and I would say that five of them are actually from... Uh, between Sault Ste. Marie and New Lister, oh, which is pretty cool to be able to do. Now there's, but even one of the ones that are in there, uh, rye, um, as people will expect us to use, right now we have to source it from Elmira, but that won't be for long because there's a lot of farmers here who plow rye right on your end. So it, it works out really well for people. Just We just have to make the linkages and we believe we've made the one for rye. Um, and so that, that's, it's, it's fun. It's uh, Part of it now seasonality affects us uh, we're behind schedule for opening so it's really difficult to take a lot of products when there's a foot of snow on the ground yes uh, and we have some things that we've managed to store before the snow went but uh, and the snow came but we'll have to see uh, we'll have That's to see part of living go. in the north it is it is and so uh, come spring uh, next year I think we're just gonna have to try and plan out further and try and take uh, botanicals or uh, grains and stockpile well in advance. Um, we'll have to see. So this is the time of that episode where I get to rant a little bit. And because it's Christmas, I'm doing kind of like a pre-Christmas fly in my soup, if that makes any sense. And I think my subject of today is patience. I know that the stores are packed. I know that restaurants are busier than normal and bars are busier than normal and the roads and driving is busier than normal. And especially up here in the north with the snow and everything, I'm pleading with people to have a little patience. I'm even noticing that some of that frustration is sometimes uh, online uh, based on the quick uh, reactions and comments, uh, sometimes more negative than it needs to be. I really want people to uh, spend more time uh, taking a breath just relaxing and enjoying the season. Uh, the next couple of weeks, of course, are going to be a little bit hectic. Uh, you're going to have people coming and going and last minute scrambles for everything. And especially when it comes to uh, restaurants and bars, uh, please be aware that the people who are serving you are probably working long hours. They are also working uh, usually during the holiday time when you've got time off. And a lot of times they are either short shifts, it's the winter, uh, they may be short staffed on occasion because of someone couldn't get there, or somebody's sick. Uh, they are trying their best. So please don't take your shopping frustrations out on the staff. Uh, they are there to serve you all throughout the year and uh, they too want an easy Christmas season. So have you heard of Crosscut Distillery? Yes. Yes. So are you, what's your favorite uh, drink that you're excited about that they're going to be creating there? 
Are you um, a gin drinker? Are you a vodka drinker? Are you a whiskey? vodka drinker? I Why got you Ukrainian vodka? blood. My last name's Ukrainian. Oh my goodness! Then yes. you're gonna be all about the oh, vodka. Exactly. Excited. Yes. So, are you excited? So, what are you hoping for from Sudbury's first distillery? Um, just kind of the idea that Stack has brought up. Just enjoying our culture while drinking. <laughs> our Sudbury culture. You know, uh, this is more regards to Stack, but it's great to you know be able to drink an expansion or a Valley Girl. So it'll be curious to see what uh, Crosscut brings up. Oh, and I know firsthand they got all kinds of plans. Oh, Just... I can't wait. Yeah, good. Okay, so I have a, this is just sort of a question because you already talked to us a little bit about your um, journey to coming to this type of business. Uh, now that you've had your, you've had enough full days getting this place open, what is the happiest moment of your day? So what would be the one of the things that really gives you joy that, yes, this is exactly where I should be doing this? Oh, for the facility. Really, the happiest moment of my day is having coffee as I wake up with my boys on the couch. Oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, I can just hear all, all the ladies are like, oh, that's so no, cute. Uh, <laughs> but that's also why I get into work really late, because I don't move very fast in the morning. Uh, I think the day that I knew things were happening was the day I found out the finances were in order, which is not a very exciting thing. <laughs> But it's it's incredibly Money. difficult for this because yeah, this is this is a business. As much as I'd like to daydream and think that I'm going to set up a little still in a garage, the realities are the distilling part of it. While maybe the funnest part for me is not necessarily what runs this place. Uh, it's and so I, I do remember when I got the final approvals for everything I needed. I know where I was and what I was doing, but. Uh, but uh, when the, the other, I guess one of those awe moments is when our big still was finally put in place. It was installed. And Say. then we, we got to look back because it's, uh, I'll show you in a minute, but it's, I think it's impressive. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, we actually even had to have it engineered because our ceilings are 18 foot five and the largest part of it is 18 foot four. And we had to, had Nothing like it. cutting it close. Yeah, well, that was it. So we had to have it re-engineered so that we dropped it close to the floor and added pumps and everything else. And uh, But it's, yeah, I think it's it's a pretty fun toy, realistically. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm awful. like, I like any other. <laughs> I was, yeah. You said it, not me. I was actually going to say that's such a man thing to say, toys, yeah, right? Uh, it's a... Uh, you know, cars and trucks are not my thing. Engines but, uh, and makes impressive. noise and it's a big beast <laughs> yeah. and yeah, I get it. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the last thing would be this time next year, if I came back, what would you like to be talking about? What would I like to be talking about? So where Our, do you want to see yourself next year? Where do you see yourself next year? Showing off what we have here to Southern Ontario. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's uh we, we need a year to to show people around here what we have and what we can make from it, but I think I think it's just as well we go down to um, the Southern Ontario LCBOs and show off our products. We go to Royal Winter Fair, do the same thing. Why not? Why, uh, Why not? Absolutely. It's, uh, people don't expect us to, to make... Uh, weirdly make good products up here and it's it's ridiculous like there's there's great like Haskap wine if you go east mm-hmm. town, which I'm sure you know uh, yes and wow. great beer across the world there's all sorts of like great food in town which I, I feel kind of ridiculous saying this to you but it's uh, <laughs> it's no that's yeah, my job I observe yeah, it I talk it's, about uh, it and so I think people around here sometimes forget it uh, but I think people in southern Ontario don't know it no, and I have to admit that the more I go to wine events or food events down in southern Ontario, less and less am I having to really describe where I live. <laughs> in specifics, it's, it's much easier now to say I'm Sud- from Sudbury. There have been some, I would say, northern Ontario-ish. You know, sometimes you get the Muskokas still calling themselves from northern Ontario. They want, they want, to, they be want to be northern Ontario. Ontario, but they're showing up at the different events. So maybe you can put it in your calendar. So this past weekend was the Gourmet Food and Wine Show in Toronto. Okay. And that was the first time I saw Loon Vodka down there. 
was down there too, and so that was a big, so exciting for a Northern yeah. Ontario girl to it see is. another Northern Ontario product down there. Yeah. But it's such a mass thing, and they started off as a wine show specifically, and now there is just as much in the um, distilleries, breweries, cocktail focus as there is wine in that event now. So it's uh, something that uh, be kind of nice to be able to, to come and visit you in your booth there next year. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So you heard Shane talk about how uh, they basically had to engineer some of the components in their distilling process or the machinery and the stills just to get pieces to fit in that building that they bought. So just to give you an overview, since you're not actually looking at it, there will be photos in the show notes if you have any interest in seeing what these stills look like that he was talking about, uh, how it's kind of laid out in the whole process. Uh, There's a whole photo gallery in the show notes. And of course, the show notes can be found. This is episode 18. So they will be at stephaniepichet.ca slash flavor 18. Flavor spelled the Canadian way, F-L-A-V-O-U-R-1-8. So just to give you a little bit visual, if you don't have a chance to look at the show notes, um, the renovations that he did to this building, once you walk in, it doesn't look like a machine shop anymore. He had uh, some custom uh, floor painting done that give the floors this finish that look almost like marble. They're just stunning. They're probably one of the first things that catch your eye when you walk in. And then along the back behind where this custom tasting bar is on the side, they have all of their barrels lined up that I was referencing earlier. Um, They have their logo on them. They're brand new and pretty, and they have a lighting that kind of shines on them and kind of deflects from the vision of the boxes that are in behind. But honestly, uh, with everything and how it's set up in there. You really don't need the boxes uh, to be part of that view or they don't bother you at all. I said that's why I was laughing when he pointed them out because I didn't even notice them because I was too busy ooing and aahing at everything else. So besides all of that, um, so there's that one area that has the stills on the one side and then the other side will be the part that's uh, where the public can go for tastings and to purchase the product uh, to take home. Um, There's two stills, which are over 18 feet tall. There's boilers, fermenters, condensers, tanks, bottling equipment. They have offices up on a second floor loft area. Um, And then the large space in front of the tasting area is going to be a great where you can not just buy it, but they'll be hosting possibly um, special events and stuff throughout the year once they're open. Um, And it's going to be a place that you could possibly even have like a little private party if you wanted to. I think that would be fun having a little tasting party in there. So he also mentioned about the different kinds of regulatory process that has to go through. So just if you decide you wanted to open your own craft distillery, there are four different licenses, uh, part federal and some of them are provincial, and then working with seven provincial Uh, sorry, seven federal departments, two provincial departments as well. And then, of course, approvals needed from the municipality, which is the greater city of Sudbury. So you think about all these different regulatory bodies that need, you have to get approval from and paperwork and inspections. That is such a massive task to open something like this. So I commend him on his patience and his grace and uh, with the help of his... uh, say his marketing partner in crime, Sarah, uh, I can see that the two of them had a, a lot of work to do. And with family and friends help, they, they really created something really special that I'm, um, I'm excited for everyone to see actually. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, and he'll probably talk a little bit more about it in this next section, having to do with keeping things local. Uh, it is a Northern Ontario distillery. He really wanted to have, uh, northern ontario feel to it using northern ontario products so he's already met with local farmers and that's where he's obtaining some of the grains that he's going to use to make these spirits and then different botanicals he wants to actually pull them from the environment that's nearby it's a very um green style of production that he's trying to create here and i think it's going to be something that'll create a unique product And it's going to be something that we'll be able to be proud of that when you see and taste uh, something that's produced by Crosscut Distillery, you'll definitely know where it comes from. 
Okay, so walk me through the process. What is, I mean, there's so much in here. Last distillery I made was about a third of the size, so. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I'd say it's medium size. It's, it's okay. comfortable, but yep. it's, uh, it's certainly not something you'd have in your garage. We're, uh, we're, it's all about heating and cooling. So we have a back in that room, which we won't show you right yep. now. It's a bit of a junk drawer. Uh, it's our boiler. And then we run five different systems of water through here, depending on the requirement for various equipment and at anywhere from city water to our cooling loop, which is a closed loop so that we don't uh, waste water. Uh, we're constantly oh, Good. Uh, cooling the same water and reusing it uh, as a means of keeping the bills uh, as at bay and so our first tank here uh, is our mash tun. It's effectively a big pot off the stove. Uh, it's got a jacket around it. it uh, it's 600 gallons, so about 2400 liters. The jacket is for heating and cooling so that there's no uh, essentially a, like a bay marie style. Mm -hmm. We can We'll use that to cook our grains, so we can bring it up to 85, 90 degrees, depending on what grain we're using and what process we're running, and then bring it down to incremental amounts so that the uh, we can adjust uh, temperature, pH, make sure that the enzymes are doing what they're supposed to, release all the sugars that'll ultimately be fermented. Um, from there, we'll use the pump that's just below there. The mm -hmm. hoses are off at the moment for tripping reasons, tripping hazards. We'll pump it over to our fermenters over there. Uh, a pretty common site for any winery, brewery, distillery to have the fermenters in there. Yep. That's really just where we keep the yeast happy. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeast need to be kept happy. The yeast yeah. need to be happy. We, uh, we give them their sugar. We make sure the pH and the temperatures uh, right for them. Uh, for something like vodka, we try and keep them as happy as possible. When we get to something like whiskey, we uh, we stress them out a bit because it uh, will adjust the flavor yeah. uh, profile. We do everything on grain, so it's a little different from, uh, say, what a, a lot of the breweries would do, and that we just keep the grain in the mash or throughout the whole process, uh, eventually taking out actually even after the distillation. Um, so from the fermenters, We'll pump that uh, mash back into one of the three stills. Now we have the baby one, which is back there, which is a test still, about yep. just over 100 liters. Uh, the gin still over there is 250, and then the large still is just over 1,200 liters. Uh, the large still gives us the greatest um, degree of flexibility, but for obvious reasons, the test still allows us to minimize waste when we're playing around with some more creative things. Uh, so if we were to run the still, we can run it in this typical like scotch style. We won't be making scotch, but say we were doing something with scotch, whereas we would run it as a basic pot still, we can run it through the whiskey head, following the two inch pipes, we bypass all the columns in the middle, it gets condensed out in its simplest form. Uh, we get alcohol to vapor from that goes through the pipes, gets reduced back to back to a liquid form, and that's that. We can also uh, do what we call our stripping runs, kind of like a preliminary run that we would do in the same manner. Now, there's three columns in between. Uh, the first column is for whiskey, uh, in the sense that it's we are going to be running our whiskey using several plates. It allows for us to separate the um, the vapors. Um, so we take so all vapor, all chemicals that are produced by yeast. So to back up a bit, all the all the chemicals produced by yeast uh, have a different boiling point. So you can have ethanol, you can have uh, acetone, you can have acetaldehyde, whatever is going to come out will run through, and they all have different boiling points. By having plates in a column, such as the whiskey column, which has four plates, it allows us to almost. Uh, create temperature differentials because of the so we heat from the bottom we cool from the top almost compartmentalize the the different components that we're trying to isolate and in the case of whiskey we don't want more than four plates to different to differentiate that'll make for a great uh, rye or bourbon style whiskey now the next column we is that's 20 a, is 20 more plates that's so impressive that's uh <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the column we had to get cut down from 18 and a half feet to, uh, and modify it with some pumps just to get it to fit into the building. But uh, 
for our vodka right now, we're running both columns together. There. So effectively oh. creating uh, 24 plates, 25 compartments in total. It allows us to really pull out the uh, and isolate the flavors that we want. Um, and from there, we can bring it off on the off the condenser at uh, over 95% alcohol. So it's uh, now we have obviously dilute that, or else uh, the LCB will get a little anxious about <laughs> putting That's that to market. That's just crazy talk. I don't, yeah. I don't know a company that that, that, that happened to this summer. Yeah, there's two companies that had recalls along those lines. <laughs> yeah, that I can think of. It's great. It gets a lot of attention. Uh, so. Yeah, so that, that's our vodka column. The third column is, uh, is our gin column. We have two gin baskets in that column, so we can run a... We will charge the, the kettle, the, the beginning of the still, with uh, effectively with vodka. It's a neutral spirit, mm-hmm. and from there we'll run the vapor, bypassing the first columns, and run it just through the baskets of gin. It creates a... Uh, using baskets for gin will create a, a lighter... Uh, a lighter flavor, uh, and it's good for things, certain components, certain, certain botanicals like um, flower, the flowering components are gentler and they prefer to be handled in that way. We could also have certain components of the gin, such as uh, juniper, could actually be put in the kettle, um, say the day before, to uh, macerate and take some of the flavors out. So from there, uh, we'll take our products, depending on the nature of the product, we can produce it in one run or two to three runs, depending on what we're trying to achieve. We'll take our product, we'll wheel it over to our scale. Our scale, that is the CRA scale for all intents and purposes. That is what determines the tax man's share. Uh, it has to be protected, it has to be uh, uh, checked on annually, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the costly machine for us. <laughs> but necessary. It, absolutely necessary. Uh, yeah, taxes are a big part of uh, alcohol production. That's doesn't matter what part you're in. So we have, and from there we have uh, we have collecting tanks. We use uh, a, a series of uh, they're actually used wine tanks, which I'm sure you recognize them um, yep. from your other adventures. We have a couple of milk tanks. Uh, we have repurposed. Uh, do what you gotta do. We yeah, we repurposed a lot from uh, from the area. Our our main cooling tank, which has our, our what we call it a cold liquor tank. Uh, our water to cool everything is actually out of Verner. Uh, a couple of the others are uh, more down the Collingwood area. And uh, you want to get some looks, you put one of those on a trailer and go across the Chi Chi Vine. <laughs> <laughs> What is he up to? Yeah, yeah, it uh, it, had, it gave some looks, much the same as bringing our gin still across the border. Uh, CBSA had uh, some questions to ask, so I spent a, <laughs> a, a good amount of time. Uh, yeah, we the Sioux St. Marie border for that one. But uh, uh, I love customs. Yeah, so it's uh, wherever filter, and then our bottling units at the end. Uh, what's not here is a, a labeler, uh, which is a smaller piece of equipment. We have a separate pump for alcohol, uh, just because of the concern for fire hazards and wanting to go home to uh, the family at night. We use one that is uh, driven solely by air. Uh, there's no electronics in it. A little bit of an extra precaution, really. And then, uh, oh, our wonderful, uh, wonderful water bin. I don't really know what to call it yet. We repurposed a, uh, an aluminum box that uh, a gentleman was using for his uh, water system up in the north end of town. But it basically, we pump our grains into it so that the grains are not going into city water. And we shovel them back out and a farmer from the valley picks them up. So it's... Recycling great. at its finest. It actually yeah. was, really, it was really cute and I, I couldn't have made this up. He came by the other day and he saw that we were... Uh, doing some work with oats, and he's like, where do you get your oats from? I'm like, well, we get them milled at Verner. And he's like, that's where I sell my oats to, and I'm like, and you're picking them back up. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so full circle, yeah. So we're, uh, we're getting oats from the valley it's, and other locations, and uh, yeah, they're going back out to the valley to feed cattle, which is pretty neat to be able to do. So I hope you enjoyed that little tour. It may have been a little bit difficult to visualize some of the components that he was describing, but if you take a look at those photos that I mentioned 
in the show notes, I actually took one really good longer picture of each of the components. And if you open it and re-listen to that one section, you'll really be able to uh, kind of see where he's pointing and what he's talking about from start to finish. Uh, There's a few pictures in there that'll probably help you do that. And if you're listening to this on your mobile device or anything else, as long as you get to a computer on the show notes page, there is a built-in player. So you can actually just hit play and then scroll down and look at the pictures at the same time. See, I made it easy for you. So uh, for more information on the Crosscut Distillery uh, here in Sudbury, Northern Ontario, you can visit them at their website, crosscutdistillery.ca. Or you can f- look at their Facebook page. They're also on Instagram as well, as well, and Twitter. Uh, I will also update on my Facebook page as soon as I hear any news about when they're opening. So especially those who are outside of Sudbury, if you want to uh, make a point of stopping in when you're coming this way next, or if you want to inquire about online ordering, I will definitely uh, update you on all the social media channels as soon as I hear, because I'm probably going to bug them until they're open. (laughs) I've already warned them. And as well, as soon as I get my uh, first tasting of uh, their wares. I will do a little update. I might even do a little Facebook live video uh, just to give you an idea of what the place looks like. So that will also be on the social media channels. So keep an eye out for that. So uh, other little notes for today's episode, just a reminder on the show notes as well. There are recipes that I've been including every single episode for the last several weeks. That is just so that you have an entire arsenal of new recipes and for your holiday entertaining season. So I've added another two cookie recipes. I included two from Christmas 2008 uh, from the last episode. And then this one, I'm going to include two recipes from 2009. Yes, I'm a bit of a nerd that as I bake things and Uh, have different recipes. I actually store them in folders based on what year I had them. So I can kind of go back and I'm just a nerd. I guess, yeah, I guess it would be a nerd that way, making sure I don't duplicate things from one year to the next or which ones worked and which ones didn't. So I wanted to share with you some of my favorites from those years. Also, of course, the uh, information about that cruise to Bordeaux in France is on the bottom of the show notes. So if you want to take the link uh, link to look at that, and you can make some inquiries if you are planning to come and join us in France uh, in August of 2018. All the information is there for you, including a downloadable PDF about the cruise and the itinerary. And then on the sidebar, not just in the show notes, but anywhere on my website, you'll also find a link to sign up for the email newsletter for Flying for Flavor. That allows you to get some additional videos. You get some information about upcoming episodes, uh, bonus recipes always. And then as I'm going to be doing more and more information about classes and things going forward, I usually include them on that newsletter as well. And it goes out in the first of every month. I don't email anyone unless they give me a Uh, permission to. So feel free to uh, just click on that and fill in your email address on the form and you will get something in your inbox inbox promptly on the first. Another little fun notice, I am happy to announce that Flying for Flavor is now on Spotify. So besides iTunes, uh, Stitcher Radio, and of course on the website, you'll now be able to catch up on all your episodes if you happen to be a Spotify user. So uh, just look for Flying for Flavor on your Spotify app and you'll be able to take me with you uh, whenever you're traveling because I think they'd be kind of fun. I really want to hear from you if you're traveling and listening to my travel episodes. I think that would be kind of a fun thing, kind of like when people go on vacation and they bring their local paper. Just bring me with you. Uh, Next week's episode, it's going to be my first Christmas episode. So I've been kind of hinting at little holiday things here and there this year, but uh, most of my family are going to be getting together a little bit earlier this year. Has nothing to do with the podcast, just the way everyone's schedule is working. So my brother and his wife and his kids are going to be in town. They'll be at our place. Um, Of course, my parents will be there and my son and his girlfriend. So we're going to have a house full for a couple of days. And it happens to be just a couple of days prior to the uh, episode airing on the 23rd. So while they're there, I've already even asked the kids to help me out. We're going to be doing some cooking and baking and we're going to share stories. Uh, Basically, Christmas to me is all about family. 
So I thought it would be fun to invite you into our little fold this year. So make sure you check that out on December 23rd. I will try to keep it as unedited and raw and just what family Christmas is supposed to be about, I promise. If you have any other suggestions for future episodes for 2018, I've got a running list, but I'm always open to suggestions. Feel free to send along your um, suggestions to my email address, which is travelqueen at stephaniepichet.ca. And of course, thank you so much to Shane and Sarah from Crosscut Distillery for uh, letting me and uh, my other partner in crime for uh, tourism here in Northern Ontario, Jordan Nixie, for giving us a bit of a tour of the distillery prior to your opening and keeping us in the loop of all your exciting uh, projects going forward. We're very excited for you. Can't wait to be there when you open the doors to wish you success in person. Uh, Don't forget to follow me on uh, Facebook, both the Stephanie P page as well as flying for flavor uh, i'm on instagram and twitter and i have two youtube channels one is my own personal one which will have a lot of my old travel videos and things like that i did before the podcast and then now we have the flying for flavor podcast where you get all the audio versions of these episodes as well as any bonus episodes in video format i will be uploading them as we go there's going to be all kinds of cool stuff happening in 2018 with recipe demos and online class etc so make sure that you subscribe to any and all of those so you can keep up to date on all things food wine and travel with a canadian flair until next week um, stay warm stay safe and we'll see you on the 23rd